now on Sports Day. Full on footy analysis with champion data's Daniel Hoyne. And great to have you back in, Horny. Uh, you got off to a flying start last week, had the uh, whole footy world talking about uh, some of your gold. Have you got a bit more gold for us? Did we just? <laughs> well, that's a uh, pretty good introduction again, Jared. But um, a pleasure to be here, Kane. No, there's, oh, yeah, there's always plenty floating around. Which game um, surprised you the most? Last week, just yep. gone. Uh, oh, I think I think a lot of games surprised me. I think the Geelong Carlton game, how, how that played out, mm-hmm. was actually quite surprising. And then um, and then probably what uh, what West Coast did Sunday Twilight was probably the most sort of you know interesting in terms of what they were able to deliver. Have you got a thought on Geelong before we uh, head to the break? Yeah, I'm, I'm probably a little bit more concerned than what some others are mm, around yeah. the Cats. In fact, you made headlines last week with Eric Hipwood. Did I just? You did. You said he should uh, be a defender, and uh, of all the uh, players that you've that have played a hundred games, he was the lowest rate. I reckon well, he. Well, I reckon he heard that because this is what he did <laughs> on Friday night. Right on halfway, Hipwood sends the Lions deep, deep into the pocket, off hands. Charlie Cameron can't get a look at it. It's out of play. I'm not a lip reader, but did Eric just say up you, Hoyne? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he abused you. Yeah, that's all right. I'm looking forward to having a coffee with Eric when he comes down to Melbourne next time, I'm sure. <laughs> he didn't touch it after that. He didn't, no. He <laughs> no, so, I, I moved 100% right. I must admit, after the first two minutes, I was pretty nervous Concerned. thinking that he's going to kick five and actually uh, rub my nose in it. But, um, yeah. Anyway. Quite an amazing performance by them, uh, wasn't it, Brisbane? Just the tenacity, the ferocity at the ball. I don't think I've seen the Melbourne midfield beaten up like that ever. No, I mean they had all their guns in. Yeah, so that was Melbourne's worst clearance game on record um, on uh, on Friday night, and you know what Dunkley and Berry and these guys were able to do to them was um, was pretty impressive, and it just goes to show you know probably just how much of it is actually above the shoulders. I would have thought too, given what uh, Brisbane did the week before against Port Adelaide. On the the one, and if you're just joining us, Horny suggestion that that Eric Hip would maybe worthwhile as a defender and not a forward. Do, do clubs seek your advice or numbers to support arguments like that? How what is your contact like with clubs? Yeah, so some clubs seek seek that advice more than others, um, and that's fine um, as well. And yeah, you know, I think just from the outside of things, Kane, as well, I think clubs sort of value a little bit, you know, that, that we're coming at it from a non-biased perspective um, as mm. well. So, you know, no opinions um, sort of associated to it. It's just purely data-driven. So, right, just having a look at a couple of his uh, suggestions, Kane. Uh, we're going to uh, whip through. We're talking about low pressure. We're talking about high punishment. We're talking about the myth of the hard ball and where the coaches stuffed up again. That'll be interesting. George Hewitt, uh, who are the players that you think are underrated at this stage or deserve some more love to put it in uh, Kane's terms. Yeah, it's a good editorial Kane. It's um and it it's one that actually, you know, just starts to get you thinking right across right across the competition and you know George Hewitt, Jared as you as you alluded to there, I mean, you know, to get him through as a free agent um and what he's done the last 12 months, you know, to be the ninth highest rated midfielder in the competition to be one of the best clearance players in the competition and to be impacting the scoreboard. Um, so you well. had him down? I have changed uh, my midfielder, who I who I think is underrated, because I I heard a whisper that you'd be going with George Hewitt, so I thought, <laughs> oh, yeah. so I thought I'd be uh, I'll, I'll change and I'll bring someone else to the table for you. So, okay, um, who is it? So the midfielder that I've gone for is an Essendon player um, who was involved in a trade uh, with Essendon um, a couple of years ago, where they gave up pick twenty nine in a future second rounder, and that's Jai Caldwell. And, and the reason, and the reason why is, you know, we've, you know, we've got a lot of reports that we use internally, but there's this, um, there's one report that I, you know, that I call the Chad Warner report. Yep. So, you know, so this um, Pick report 39. alluded to me um, to how damaging Chad Warner was three years ago. So it's just simply looking at how often you win the ball and how often that possession turns into a score. And last year there was no there was no better midfielder in the competition at turning one of his possessions into a score than what Jai Caldwell was, just ahead wow. of Bonton Pally, yeah. just ahead of Dugowie, and just ahead of Chad Warner, who those three we we all recognise now yep. as being elite in the competition. And he's playing a slightly different role now for Essendon, but he's had the impact on matches so far um, across the first two weeks. So I, just one to keep an eye on. I love that stat, Jared and Horney, because. Um, we get overwhelmed with numbers, mm. don't we? Because yep. the, mid, the midfields just get so many. And now the backs, like if you look at like Ryan's numbers from, from West Coast and Cox the first two weeks, they're yep. getting midfield numbers. So you yep. just get swamped and new kick-in rules and kick to you, all that. I don't know what to look at. Yep. So the efficiency to get a possession and how often that turns into a score, 
has to be a great stat. There must be a flip side to that, Hornian, and, and you've been given no notice on that. But the players that get a lot of the footy but don't have the same impact on the scoreboard per touch is one that we may look at throughout the year. Yeah, I can have that too. Yeah, by the end of the night, Kane, that's always the, yeah, the other way to actually look at it as well. Well, somebody's just texted through straight away on Tom Mitchell. His impact numbers this year compared to his Brownlow mm. year. Yeah, that was the one I was thinking as well. Yeah, yeah. So it is interesting because I mean, it's you know, you know we've had this discussion internally, came for a number of years. I mean, if you were to start analysing and reviewing player performance now compared to what we've done for the last fifty years, how would you do it? And and more often than not, I put my hand up. I I tend to actually not look at the disposal count to actually start with. It's more mm. you know the scoreboard and what's actually taken place mm. from your impact. Scoreboard wise, and the Tom Mitchell scenario, I mean, you know, he's averaging um, 20 AFL player rating points per game so far this season. And, you know, 20. Now, put, and that, put that, that in the context. context if, he, if, if, he, if he did that across the whole season, that would be a top 10 season that we've seen by any player mm. over the last 15 years. So, so over the years, we've had Dangerfield with a 20 and uh, Dusty, Dusty for the 20? Of, yeah, so I think of Dangerfield in his Brownlow year, Martin in his Brownlow year, Fife in his Brownlow year. I mean, they're, they're elite seasons, but I think more to the point, is that he's doing it off the back of only averaging 24 disposals mm. so far this season. So, so his possessions high, are it's, gold. It's high impact. Yep. Jai Caldwell, just to circle back on that one, one of those GWS players that left after only two years as well. Um, so a great pickup. There's been you know, Tanner Bruin and Jackson Haightley as well, to name a few that have left after a couple of seasons. That was Horny's Gems. And no, you no, can no, have no your... he's got a couple of others for other he's players. Got... Well, you got some more. Well, I've just got a couple more just to throw at you if you've got um, if you just got a little bit. So plenty of time. So I think um, I think one for Port Adelaide, Kane, and you might sort of hopefully back me up on this, or you might not, and that's Can fine I guess as it? well. Can I guess it? Go. SPP. SP. Uh, he he was he was up there uh, for me, but I've gone somewhere else, and I've gone with Dan Houston. Yeah, well, that was my second guess. So Dan Houston. So if you have a look at his profile and where he's come from, you know, rookie. Rookie listed to begin with, fantastic selection by um by the Port Adelaide um, list management team. But his his profile as a defender is is quite complete. I mean, he impacts the game from an intercept point of view. He, he he gains meters and he uses the ball quite well. But the other thing too that you'd probably notice over the last couple of years is that he does get used in the midfield to break glass when needed mm-hmm. as well. So I think he's such a he's such a rounded a rounded player and such a um. A, you know, a, a key weapon for um, for Ken Inkley and the coaches to use. One more to leave us with before we move on to your overall observations. Yeah, one of my favourites, and we probably got smashed for this a couple of years ago. But Dylan Moore um, is one of my favourites, and mm. sort of, you know, pick you know pick sixty seven in the draft four or five years ago, and Hawthorne have got a long rebuild ahead of them. We know that, but this guy is going to be key to that. And in, in, you know, and in in terms of what he's done for the last you know twelve twenty four months, only Toby Green is rated higher um, as a general forward um, across the competition. So, Where's he most effective? Horny is it, is it that forward who can pinch hit Tom Papley style, or would you rather see him have more midfield minutes? No, I'd rather see him just be used in the Tom Papley role. I just I just think he's so good at what he does. Just you know, keep that asset in play. So we'll follow the same uh, format as last week. Won't take calls in this particular hour. We'll take your uh, texts uh, and uh, we'll whip through those at the, the end of the session. But your overall observations, Horny, of yeah, the round. So I think it's interesting. You know, again we. <laughs> I'll be a little bit more excited in, in a couple of weeks' time when we do have that sample size worth yep. of data. We've got that four or five week worth of period. But um, I think just something just to keep note of is just the lack of pressure that we're seeing across the competition in the opening two weeks of the year. And if it keeps going along this way, it'll be the lowest pressure season that we've seen in about seven or eight years. It's so, got to be linked to ball movement, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, as a result, you know, and we talked about it last week, ball movement so far, and it continued on the weekend, has just been so, so good to watch um, as a result. So I, I think there are a number of reasons. I think teams wanting to go forward and go long and be more direct is actually taking the ball from congestion out. Um, and and therefore, you know, it, it makes it quite difficult to actually apply pressure. But we've seen, you know, we, you know we've seen it be a forward half game for for you know, a number of years, and whilst I still think teams are, are, are trying to play that way, the numbers so far across the first two weeks are actually pointing um, you know, slightly differently. So uh, the turnover is the crime. How's the punishment been in <laughs> these first two weeks? Yeah, so you know, we're, seeing, we're seeing fewer turnovers um, across the competition so far, and that's probably backed up by the, um, the lack of pressure that we're seeing. But we're seeing the punishment rate actually higher than what it's been for the last four or five years okay. as well. So, so more goals per turnover. Correct, correct. So it, it, it's going hand in hand, which is great. 
Who are the teams doing maximum damage off the turnover? I'm, I'm assuming it's all the ones at the top of the ladder, led by Collingwood, but has been a strength of Richmond's. And are they winning the turnover but not punishing well, the opposition as effectively as they perhaps would like to? Yeah, so they're winning plenty of it. They're winning plenty of it, but their um, their conversion rate just isn't there yet. Which I, I wouldn't be too fussed or, or worried about that if I'm a Richmond supporter. I think it's more. I think that part of your game will come as the season goes on, and we'll get into Richmond as we go as we go through. But but I think um, I think one you know well clearly Collingwood are, um, are through the roof at the moment. But the interesting one um, as well is GWS. So they haven't got the wins, and they didn't get the win against West Coast on the weekend. Um, but you know Adam Kingsley is referencing. You know, very similar to what Hardwick does in, in, in terms of a Richmond game. He's mm. been referencing a Giants game and what that actually looks like. And their punishment rate at the moment has been high. Mm. Their conversion has been poor in both games. Yep. So they're doing a lot right, GWS, despite losing that game against West Coast. I saw Jesse Hogan miss three from about 30 metres out. Uh, so if you get your opportunities, mm. you've got to nail them. Let's move on. Uh, you, your talking points last week were superb. Can you uh, better that? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But anyway, but no, there's plenty to talk about again. But we'll start with Collingwood. I mean, they're the flavour of the month, um, aren't they, at the moment? And, you know, there's a lot of talk at the moment about what they're doing from a contest perspective. And it's, you know, obviously quite you know, significant on the back of what they did last year. But I just want to just break down their contest game, if if I can. And, you know, the ground ball side of things. So that's, you know, so when we're talking about ground ball, that's just when the ball's on the deck and it's a 50-50 contest, you know, either you're a turn to win it or the opposition are a chance to win it. And there's two ways that you can win it at ground level. There's either the hard ball gap, so you're winning that under under physical pressure with someone right right on you, um, or the loose ball gap, where, you, where you're still winning it um, at ground level in a contest, but you haven't got that bloke hanging off you. So you've got a greater opportunity to make an effective decision. And this is, what, and this is where Collingwood are kings at the moment. So their hard ball differential in the first two weeks is minus, is minus 14 um, across the competition. So they're losing hard ball. Losing hard ball. By a significant amount. But their loose ball yep. is close to plus 35 on their opposition. So if you watch Collingwood, if you watch Collingwood play, just don't expect them to all swarm in on that, on that one ball to win. Just watch them just hang back from the contest. Wait for that... Wait for that ball just to just bobble out, bobble out, and then you'll see the likes of Pendlebury or Dacos or Mitchell quickly just make that decision, and then they can explode. They don't invest in winning that in in that hard ball as much as what they do the loose ball, which is a great. It's a beautiful thing. It is, yeah. is a beautiful thing. I had a look at it on the Sunday Footy Show on the weekend. Now plus twenty five in ground balls versus Port Adelaide. Tom Mitchell had twelve of them, and the word is trust for me that the teammates trust their teammate to win it one on two or one on three, and then they hold out knowing they don't have to go in because he's going to win it. And then once he does win it, you've got the out number on the outside and the ball's gone. Like mm. the, the way they can flick it out with two, three handballs and then get it into a play with time and space to deliver inside 50. And I mentioned this, that Phil Walsh is the far, smartest footy person I've ever met and he just raved about ground balls. And you may even remember he, he sent Adelaide off the jetty yeah. Because they didn't win the ground ball battle. Yeah. And, and Ross Lyon speaks about that ground ball battle as well a lot when you hear him talk. But I remember the, his first year in charge. Sorry, Jared. I remember his first year in charge at Adelaide. He had a ground ball ladder yep. that, he was, that he was keeping track of. Not the AFL ladder, the ground ball ladder. Because a contested possession, like we all talk about, but that can be a free kick against. You yeah. know, what other category? Like it can be a ruck a when you from the ruck. Yeah. So yeah. maybe it's not as accurate holistically if you're looking at you know the, the, the battle, the football battle as a ground ball yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. But I think the the point you're making is probably an overemphasis on the hard ball and, um, and, and an underemphasis on the loose ball. There are some recruiters that I know that look at the loose ball winners as almost primary as to whether or not he's going to be a good player or not. Just before you answer that, uh, Hoyne and Jared, the breaking news from the tribunal, Nathan Broad has been suspended for four matches, which is what the AFL asked for. Richmond pleaded guilty and, and they were going to accept their lot. They, they tried to say that his good record should be taken into consideration. Uh, they didn't listen. And Jared, off the top, you spoke about this. Are you okay with four or I feel like you think it should be more? No, no, I think that he should get four because that's the expectation. I mean, until the AFL up the ante, then you can only give what others have got. Otherwise, I think uh, you're being unkind or unfair and uh, they, therefore you're going to get a challenge. But... Uh, Four is fine under these circumstances. That's what the Matrix would have spat out if uh, they had have gone down that way and said it was intentional, I suspect. Um, but the question is, what does Andrew Dillon do with mm. our expectations, 
when he sits down finally to have a chat to us about where the game is in its battle against these incidents. Well, why don't we put the call in tomorrow and see if he'll come on and then see if we have any more success than what we've had um, recently before you and I have started this program because it hasn't been much. Hoyne, you were speaking about the uh, the loose ball gets. Yeah, I mean, so if you have a look at some of the players across the competition, um, you know, so far this year, we're talking about LDU, who's number one in the loose ball category, Oliver, Parrish. But then you have a look at some players over the last couple of years, and this is this is what stands out to me. So Sam Walsh, Sam Walsh is one of the best loose ball players in the competition, and that stands out on the eye to me. I, I very rarely see Sam Walsh in and under trying to win that ball, but he's so clever in, in actually, you know, picking up where that ball's actually going to bobble to. I'll get to that space and then I'll explode. Tim Kelly is exactly the same. Hugh McCluggage is exactly the same. And really exciting for North Melbourne is that only two games in, Harry Sheasel so far this mm. year is one of the best loose ball players in the competition as well. Okie doke. So uh, that's your first observation or talking point. Second, we move to the Tigers. Yeah, so just off the back of pretty much what you were just talking about before came um, with Richmond, and then you know I think it's probably going to be a challenge for them um, against Conley with this this Friday night, just given how well Conley were going. But I don't think it I don't think it matters too much for Richmond because I think what they're doing at the moment, you know, they they might not get the win, but if they can continue to play the way that they're playing, Hardwick bangs on about it, but it is a Richmond it is a Richmond style of game. So they are again this year they are number one so far across the first two weeks at winning the ball back off the opposition mm-hmm. in the fourth half of the ground, which which usually stacks up to success. But they're sixteenth at converting them into scores. I think that part will come. They're fourth for time in forward half again, which again the last six, last decade all six premiers have been top six in that in that category. But they're seventeenth of scoring when they go inside fifty. Mm. Historically, Richmond have actually been quite good at that area. So I think that I think that part of their game will come. But importantly for them, importantly for them, they've gone from being the eighth easiest team last year to turn a um, a chain into a score against to now being the sixth hardest mm. team to do that. So I, I think that they're doing a lot right. They've got some personnel changes. They've made some shifts in what they're doing from a clearance perspective. That I, I think Richmond are a classic example that they they should get better as the year goes on, which is exactly what you want to be doing, and it's exactly what Richmond have done when they've had success between 2017 and 2020. Okay, built into the year. I think that uh, Geelong are trying to implement that sort of strategy. Are you concerned about where they're at? Yep. Yeah, no, I'm I'm concerned with where they're at. And why are you concerned? What are the numbers telling you they're not doing? I'm purely I'm purely concerned from a defensive point of view, and understandably, people will throw back and 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 rightly so that Stewart is missing and Henry is missing, Coladashney is missing, and Duncan's missing from pretty much their back seven or back eight that they had for most of the year last year. But in terms of what they're doing from a defensive group in a one-on-one contest so far this year. There's been no harder team to beat in a one-on-one contest than Geelong. So mm. Asava's holding up one-on-one, you know, um, De Conning's holding up one-on-one, Guthrie's holding up one-on-one. So they're doing their job one-on-one. Yep. But what's falling down at the moment is the system perspective defensively. And what I'm talking about is Geelong, since 2016, in, in terms of points against from turnover, this has been their ranking for the best part of seven years. Been first, fourth, second, first, fourth, first, first. This year, 17th. Boy. 17th. That's the area of the game that is that is alarming mm. right now. And that What do you attribute that, that to? That that there is is um it's a, combi- a, com- a, a combination of system, is a yep. combination of work rate, is a combination of poor skills. But that that's that's where sixty percent of scoring is coming from. Mm. So mm. their work from a stoppage perspective at the moment is actually okay. But once the ball actually leaves that area, they're getting left behind and they're not able to defend it like they, what they've done for seven or eight years. And people will say that Stewart's out at the moment is the most important player. Well, Stewart was out for four weeks last year too. Yeah. And they won all four games against quality opposition in that period. Well, they're not, well, they're not doing the same thing mm. this way. And the only thing I just wanted to raise it for is that, yeah, I, I think it's close to a 50-50 game against Gold Coast on Sunday. Mm. And if they lose to Gold Coast on Sunday, well, then they're going to be a story. Yep. But I, I don't think it should be a surprise if they do if they do lose it. And I understand if they do win, well, then they've got Hawthorne and West Coast the next couple of weeks after. But we'll talk about this all year on this show. It's more how you play, not the results that are happening. Mm. And that's um, so that's you, a concern. He, he gives great confidence, doesn't he? And he doesn't sound concerned at all. You listen to the, the post-match media conference and 
there seems to be a level of calm and, and control. But do you think internally they're looking at the numbers going, hang on, red flags everywhere? Or do you think they've got extraordinary belief that they will turn things around pretty quickly? They should have extraordinary belief because of what they've done for the best part of 15, 16 years and making 12 prelims or whatever it is in 16 years. I understand that. And I understand, I understand why everyone's got confidence in them. And, you know, if they turn things around, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be shocked, Yeah. but I just think we should be treating this with more sort of, um, you know, more sort of red flag sort mm. of, you know, type analysis, if you like, as opposed to just, you know, you know, just pushing it to the side. It's only around two, it, it's Geelong, they'll be fine. I think, you know, you got to, you got to treat it for what it actually is. Do you have a marker in the season, be it a round or be it you know a month, where you've got enough data to analyse accurately? Because you know it's hard to make sweeping judgments so early yeah. on into the season. Yeah, no, we we have a little champion data party inside. Kane, when it gets to about round five, around six, when our sample yeah. size, where the data is actually you know now fair deck, and now we can sort of make these real assessments as opposed to just flagging them and just you know sort of you know keeping it on watch. Well, a quick text uh, from. Uh Somewhere out there in the uh, SEN land. How grim is it looking for Gold Coast? Ben King just doesn't look like he's enjoying himself. I'd say that would be a St Kilda supporter hoping that uh, they can land him next year. But uh, you've already said they can beat the Cats. Yeah, I mean, they're, I mean, they're not travelling. They're not travelling um, that well, mind you. Um, but they're coming up against a team who's not travelling well either. Yeah, yeah. So that's why uh, that that's why I think that they're a chance. And they're a different, they're a different team more often than not um, up at the Gold Coast. Um you know, than what they are away. I don't think that was a um, horrific performance against no. Essendon. Um, I thought their week one performance against Sydney was far worse than what they dished up against Essendon. Saints and Jack Sinclair you've got down here. Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of love, and fair enough too, a lot of love going Nick Dacos's way um, at the moment with what he's doing across halfback and probably, you know, potentially changing the role um, as such in terms of how much damage is actually coming from what he's doing behind centre. But I, I just wanted to have have the discussion or just raise it in, in, in terms of whether or not he has actually established himself, Jack Sinclair, that is, as the most damaging halfback flanker in the game. Probably not right now with um, with Nick Dacos, but I think he has to be in that same conversation. Mm. I mean, if you have a look at, at the last two years, he is by far and away the number one rated defender yep. in the competition. And again, Kane, you know, we talk about mm. impact. The impact that he has from his disposals is so significant. I mean, he's he's so integral to what St Kilda has done for the last twelve months from a ball movement perspective, and I think I think if you're Essendon, it's just Essendon and everyone else coming up against St Kilda. I, I'm just intrigued to see how much time actually goes into this guy moving forward. So he should be tagged. I noticed the lizard was tagged by I think it was Finn McGuinness, Finn McGuinness. on the weekend, and you know didn't. Didn't stop him, but certainly curtailed him. He's another damaging player. Yeah, I mean, so we've seen St Kilda over the last couple of years potentially, you know, at, at times have both Hill and Sinclair across halfback. So they've got two, you know, of the better ball users going yep. around. Well, Hill's been used in a different role so far this year in that wing half forward role. So I think it's just interesting in terms of what teams actually do with Jack Sinclair moving forward. This guy's an absolute star. So still to go on the talking points, we've got North Melbourne, we've got the Bombers, we've got the Eagles, and who did the coaches miss? otherwise known as where they stuff up the coaches, Kane. That comes up uh, as well after the and break. And horror, if you don't we mind. Like We're here one. for the award-winning seven-seat Kia Sorento and for Maccas, make your AFL pre-game routine count with Maccas. Uh, Hoiny is with us, and you want to speak about North Melbourne and a lot of people looking to receive the love, North fans. They feel like they've been left out. What's your thoughts on North? Yeah, I think it's interesting to see what they're doing from a selection perspective at the moment, North, and... If I said to if I said to you and um, and and Jared Kane that uh, on the weekend just gone that North were in fact the eighth most experienced team for the round, mm. I, I think that might actually probably surprise a lot of people. Yeah, dude. Um, you know they had you know, what they have nine players who you know who had played a hundred plus matches and five um, sorry six that had played under fifty games. So that'd make them more uh, experienced probably than Freo. Yeah, it was. Yeah, so they were more experienced and older. Um, you know. I, on average per player than what um, than what Fremantle were on the weekend, so I think it's I think it is interesting in terms of how how they're trying to protect some of these some yep. of these young guys coming through with you know with some older heads um, around them. So you know Powell on the weekend I thought was fantastic. 
Comden, on, um, yeah, he, he's showing some really good signs. Looks a big a, beast, uh, Comden. Yeah, I mean, he, he, you know, he's just a competitor um, in what he does across centre half order and, and has been huge for Larky so far. You know, clearly Sheasel um, is actually going well. William so, Shields is a really interesting inclusion, though. Yeah, so I, and I think I think for someone like, um, you know, a Will Phillips at the moment, and, you know, there might be um, a few North Melbourne supporters out there wondering where Will is at the moment. I, I think it's I think it's actually not too bad on their behalf, just to just give him some some game time at VFL level and and don't rush him. I mean, th- this kid for the last you know two years has been has been impacted by injury, glandular fever um, yep. as, as well. So I think at the moment, just you know, there's no rush, and and you saw with what Clarkson did at Hawthorne as well. There was no rush to get Lewis in. There was no rush to play Ruffhead. There was no rush to play Franklin every single week, or, and these guys. It was just it was a slow it was a slow slow build, and, and 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 be and be happy and be prepared to spend some time in the VFL. Are the Bombers the real deal? Uh, I don't think they are at the moment, and that's and that's okay given where they are from a um, from a list um, you know perspective. Mm. Most weeks they're actually quite quite young and um, and quite inexperienced, and I, I'm just intrigued to see to see how how their method under Brad Scott goes this week against against Ross um, and and what St Kilda have been able to do. In so, particular, what? So so far across the first two weeks, and again, it is hard. You know, in all due respect, it is hard when teams um, have come up against Hawthorne at the moment because the numbers can sort of lie um, a little bit. But it 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 does look like Hawthorne, um, sorry, Essendon are playing um, a high possession, high marking sort of game. Um, you know, which is helping them in terms of what they're doing defensively, and you know, in particular in terms of how they're defending the turnover. But Ross and St Kilda have come up against. Um, Fremantle, who took 130 marks, yep. and came up against the Dogs, who took 111 marks, and both of them have been able to go nowhere with ball in hand because of what they're doing from a from a defensive system um, perspective. So I think this is a really good and early challenge for Essendon to see whether or not this method um, actually holds up against what has been a really a really tight and um, and well organised defensive unit. You got some thoughts on the Eagles. Yeah, I mean, it was great. It was, it was, it was great, and it was just so um, refreshing to see West Coast play the way that they played on Sunday night. Actually, I mean, handballed the ball forward occasionally. I'm not sure what you two thought, Kane and Jared, watching it. I didn't. You know, it was hard to actually recognise West Coast, yeah. to be honest, in terms of how how they actually played. So, you know, their ability to to go forward with ball in hand, their ability to go long and direct was um, was pretty obvious. And you know, it was the first time in in four years where they've where they've won a game taking under 85 marks. For the day, mm. so it was it was a totally totally different totally different West Coast, and and I think if 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 I can just you know Jeremy McGovern, his first two weeks have been superb. Yep, so back I to think, his best. I think him him and Jake Lever. I mean I mean Lever's second half of last year was was um was quite quiet by his yep. um you know standards, but but both of them have been you know probably regarded as the best interceptors in the competition over the last five six seven years, and they both appear to be back to their very best. A couple year. of Tiger supporters have texted through wanting to know where Rioli sits uh, in comparison to Sinclair. Uh, Daniel Rioli. Yep. yep. Uh, yeah. So Daniel Rioli, so far, um, yeah. So so far this year has been has been highly rated, um, but in terms of what he did last year, it was it was um, it was around about that above average level. So right. a very good player, but just a little bit off that top ten percent um, for his position. You touched on um, Western Bulldogs last week and some of their numbers, and I I listened to Luke Beveridge speak after the game. He seems confused, and then Marcus Bontempelli spoke after. The game, I think it was yesterday, and, and basically said we just got to focus on one area that, that we're not doing well. That that says a few alarm bells to me is that they're a bit lost because it's not just one area that needs fixing. There's a whole host of areas of their game that have broken down. Does that do the numbers back that up? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so we talk about you know the the concerns with Geelong at the moment, and and for me, they're you know they are around one area, and that is defending turnover, if you like. Unfortunately for the Bulldogs, they've got concerns in multiple areas. And I think realistically, when you've got concerns in multiple areas, it's not just going to be a one, two, three week fix where you're going to be able to turn this around really quickly. So it's interesting where you take that conversation in terms of what do you fix first? Do you mm. get back to, to actually getting your one wood, which is your contest and clearance game back to, you know, top two, top three in the competition? Do you worry about, you know, your transition game, which has been quite strong for a number of years, which is now 17th in the competition? Do you worry about defending transition, which 
has has always well not always has has more often than not been a, been a concern for him, which is seventeenth in the competition. Mm. Uh, the, when you're having when you're having those conversations, I can imagine that's a one gigantic headache in terms of where do you actually start first. So it'd be, it'd be interesting to see what they do this week. We're seeing some teams bounce back from a contest and clearance perspective quite quickly. Maybe that might be the starting point against the Lions yep. this week. Rightio, uh, let's get down to business, Hoiny. Who did they miss, the coaches, in their coaches' voting? And we'll begin with uh, the Blues over the first match. Did they miss anybody there? Yeah, I think Matthew Kennedy might have got missed sure. um, in this game. Yeah, he, he was the third highest rated player on the gra- on the ground behind um, oh, well. behind Jeremy Cameron um, and Adam Saad on the weekend. You know, 26 disposal, 11 contested possession, possessions and seven score involvement. So and no vote. High, one of the high-impact games that we keep on talking about. Okay, the votes in that game, Cameron, Kerno, Saad, Kerno. Wietering, Akers and Smith, but no love for Matthew Kennedy. No love. We'll move on. Josh Dunkley. Yeah, so Josh Dunkley got two votes in the Coaches Award yeah. uh, on the weekend, but but having a look at, at, at the impact that he had on the matches, it probably should have got either the eight or the ten um, right. in terms of what he did. So that was that was actually his eighth highest rated game across his whole career on the weekend. Wow. 26 disposals, 15 contested, nine clearances, and the other aspect that I love, 81 pressure points. So mm. to put that into perspective, that that will be probably a top 10 to top 20 uh, pressure game across the whole season by any player That's this what year. For. So, you know, we talk about the dogs and what they've lost. They've lost everything that Josh mm. Dunkley did. Um, and that's exactly what on Brisbane Friday night. got so, him for. Because defensively they were poor. And, and yeah. they, they spoke to us about his defensive work and his smothers and that pressure that he's been putting on. So they'd be wrapped with that. That is one of your finest uh, tonight, Josh Dunkley, uh, in the top 10 games for his career and uh, wasn't recognised. Um, who's next? A lot of love for Collingwood and, and a lot of their players at the moment. So, okay. you know, can understand why some players do get missed. Nick Dacos how... got nine. Darcy yes. Cameron got eight. Josh Dacos, six. Johnny Noble, good. Kane's man, he got three. Yeah, they were all very good. But one that I thought was exceptional was still side bottom. So we talk about what Collingwood are doing at the moment from a um, from a ball movement perspective, and they're so good to watch. Yep. And, they're, and, they're, and they're trying to bite off a lot of these challenging kicks. Well, he's... He, he is sitting seat 1A in terms of what he's doing from a ball use perspective. So his ball use across the first two weeks is going 33% above AFL average for the type of kicks Ooh. that he's trying to pull off. It is remarkable what he's doing. And as a result, as a result, that was his highest rated game since 2017. So His you know, best game since 2017, Kane. So, so Kane, it's we amazing. talk about, you know, so we keep talking about impact and that's that's yep. that's all that we're trying to yeah, measure. Be, I reckon impact. he had 22 or something. 24 disposals he had. 24, yeah. So he, he's and what had, did he actually rate? He, he's had games where he's had 30, 35, 40 plus, but the impact yep. hasn't been there. This is what Collingwood are doing. It's a low. It's it doesn't need to be a 30, 35er to mm. actually have low the impact. Low possession, high impact. And it's just high impact with what he's with what he's doing. So what was his rating number? Have you got it? Twenty two. He rated for Ooh, that game. Twenty two. So that, that is a uh, that is a game that's off the charts. And so your average A grade game is what fourteen and above. 15. Fifteen. Anything anything fifteen and above should be considered as an elite. And he's fifty percent above that. That's extraordinary. That's quick math. That's not better than me. Was a, there uh, was a former Collingwood player. So uh, he's now at a new club that missed out on some love, Hoiny. Yeah, so you know a tight game, Fremantle news, um, and and North Melbourne. But I thought um, I thought what James H did from a Fremantle perspective was um, was actually quite impressive. So you know they've lost they've lost Blake Acres to Carlton, so they have to find that wing replacement this year. And and so far across the first two weeks, he he's moved into that role. Now, so 29 disposals on the weekend, but he was the number one rated player for Fremantle. So only only LDU and Jai Simpkin were rated above him um, on the ground mm. um, as a whole on Saturday night. And and you know, and we keep talking about Fremantle and their and their sort of you know their struggles to actually be daring with ball in hand. Well, he was able to gain close to 600 meters um, on the weekend, which is one of his better games across his career. So I think um, what did he rate? He, he rated about a 17. What did Andrew Brayshaw rate? Uh, good question without notice there. Okay. I'm not going to make Sorry. up a number, so I, can't, I, don't, I don't actually have that. Because he got two votes, and Sam Swiskowski <laughs> for Fremantle got two votes, and Luke Ryan got five, but uh, no love for James Aish. One final one before uh, we move on. Yeah, and you know, the theme here is high impact, high impact, yep. high impact, and we'll finish off with Dylan Shield. So, so Dylan Shield's probably had his knockers over the journey, um, you know, probably the last four or five years, but... But his game on the weekend, you know, Darcy Parrish gets a lot of love and fair enough too. He had a high impact game. But Dylan Shield, 27 disposals, 11 contested, two goals. 
and again to um, to have a ratings game of um, of, of over twenty um, on the weekend against um, a, a, against Gold Coast just shows the impact that he's having. You know, on, um, probably what I was impressed with, you know, twenty seven or twenty six, I suppose, whatever I just said then. But but over half of them were won in the fourth half of mm. the ground. So it's not it's not cheap ball yep. anymore for Dylan Shield and. I think um, yeah, you know, I, I think he's one to watch if you're a um, if you're an Essence supporter moving forward and the impact yep. that he's having. Good coaching. Uh, he had seven clearances, nine grand ball gets, a couple of goals as well. I thought he was terrific and has had a really good start to the year. And, and to be fair, a good um, finish to the back end of last year after they moved him on ball. That was the good Hoiny. <laughs> now it is time for Hoiny's horror. All right. Well, we've got a uh, we'll have a bit of a conversation around this, I think, Kane. And, we're, and we're... I, I must admit, I, I asked for these numbers. No. So if you want to blame me, you can no, not... well and truly put the blame no. on me. But no, I want to speak blaming. about the two big ruckmen at Fremantle and the drop off. Granted, small small couple of games that we're looking at, but. From my observation, it's been significant. What are the numbers? One say? of those ruckmen was on the front page of the West Australian this morning. What was the headline? Um, no action. Was it no, no action, action Jackson? Jackson? It was. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So no, it, it's it's an interesting discussion, and it's probably it's probably going to take Justin Longmuir and Freeman a little bit of time to work out how how to use these guys. But so you know, the impact that they're having on match on matches so far this year simply isn't there. I mean. I mean, Sean Darcy was in all Australian conversation or you know all Australian squad conversation yes, at times was. last year. His game on the weekend against North, I mean, that was his lowest rated game of of his career. Worst game ever. Lowest rated game of okay. his career. We've got to phrase it a bit nicer. I might see Sean in the street at some stage. So, but um, yeah. So and that was playing. That was only playing seventy percent ruck time. So I, I don't know what you think, Kane and or, or Jared yourself, but but these guys ruckman just. I think most of them want to play one out as a as mm. a genuine as a genuine ruck. We've seen that with Darcy Cameron. I mean, that's a good example, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Grundy goes, and he's now in all Australian contention. When if you said that two years ago about Darcy, you would you would have laughed. But that's what they want, and that is why I said yesterday that um, Sean Darcy will probably look for a new home at the end of the year. He would see the writing on the wall that Jackson's not a forward, so that will mean he has to play forward. But as the numbers are telling you, he's not a forward. Uh, and and the issue is sort of what's actually happening when they do go inside 50. So so combining it between the two of them, they've been targeted 13 times inside 50 this year as a pairing. Not one score has come as a result of when they've been targeted inside 50. Yeah, but th- this thing can change dramatically if their ball movement changes dramatically. Yep. I, I saw Luke uh, Jackson play with Max Gorn as everyone else did in his first year. He was fantastic. Not as a forward, though, I don't No, reckon, no. Jared. Well, that's that's fine. But don't I, play him as Gorn, a forward. Gorn, but Gorn had more tricks than Darcy. So Gorn could go behind the ball. Gorn could go forward. Gorn Darcy can play. do all those. Not as quickly. I, I, underst- yeah, I understand I that. But, well, then, if if uh, Geelong can work two sort of 50-50 ruckmen together, I think that's the model. surely you can do it with these two guys who are that's both the outstanding model. talents. Yeah, the- the int- it's interesting for me how they how how they're going to use Jackson more so than than Darcy mm. and I, I I just you know watching Jackson as a kid and just watching his highlights um, as a kid you know playing for WA I, I looked at him as a as a you know best part of a two hundred centimeter midfielder, midfielder yeah. to be honest because what he was doing at ground level and we talked about ground balls before Kane I mean that was that was exceptional so so whether or not whether or not they start looking at him what are they and playing play, like play, and, 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 and mm. you know, I was about to say and you know and playing him like a, a blitzarv yeah. um, where you actually do then have a point of difference on the on the competition you know because your midfielder at the moment is getting torched. At the moment, right. yep. I mean, you know, minus 15, 16 centre clearances or, or you know, clearances, whatever it was on the weekend. So so something does need to change. In fairness, I think it is going to take time. But but right now, it's um, it's a fair way off um, probably where they wanted it to be. Great stuff, Horny. Thanks for stopping by.